I think that after the game itself, your trailers are by far your most important promotional tool. Do not leave trailer planning to the last minute. Trailers are vital and should have ample time and attention paid to them. Do not make your trailer an afterthought at the end of an ex uh, exhausting push towards launch. When you launch a game on Steam or console, your trailer will be the first thing that people see. Yeah. If it does a poor job of conveying the awesomeness of your game, your sales will suffer. Here oh, yeah. are some of the things I do when planning a trailer. Okay. First, start early. When you come up with the design of a game, think about what its potential trailer could be like. If you can't think of an effective way to express the design's hooks in a trailer, it may not be the right design. Next, keep it short. I see so many indie trailers that last for two minutes or more. I think you should show the most exciting and hooky parts of your game as fast as possible and then stop. Preferably yep. one minute or less. Do not let the excitement... That's what Bloons does too. It's about one minute, 50 seconds, something like that. Really and fast. Drop. Boom, boom, People boom. People may stop watching. You don't need to show them every feature in the game. You want to show them some awesome things and then stop, leaving them wanting to know more. Mm -hmm. Next, get to the action. People don't want to see your company logo. They want to learn about the game. If you want to include your logo, you should do it at the end, in my opinion. And also, at the last Steam Dev Days convention, Valve suggested that you test the first five seconds of your trailer muted to see how visually appealing it is. Cool. Most nice Steam idea. users have trailers initially muted by default. If they are quickly browsing through their discovery queue, you may only have five muted seconds of video to grab their attention. That is, that is a really good idea. I think that showing review quotes and accolades at the start is smart, as they let viewers know that this is a trailer that they should pay attention to. No, I wouldn't do that anymore. Maybe not at this time anymore. Maybe back then, but not anymore. I think it has the opposite effect. Maybe I'm wrong. Please, guys, tell me if you take attention to accolades and awards. But even still, you want to keep it to just a second to, or two. The worst thing your trailer can do Sweet is baby ink five stars. stop watching. Now, think hard about your music. I think this is a weak point uh, of many indie oh, yeah. trailers. Oh, yeah. In general, you want to leave the player energized, not sleepy. And you want them to go and buy your game right away, not go have a nap. I plan all of my trailers around the music. You ideally want some kind of build-up and climax. You want your viewers to feel something. And music, video, and audio are a powerful way of achieving this. Don't just take some random track from your game and slap gameplay footage over it. Oh yeah. Plan carefully how the music and audio are going to build- I want to test something here in this example. We're going to take a look at a game that got incredible help after it blew up. Vampire Survivors, the first time it blew up, didn't have all of the fancy things it has now. He got a lot of help from very professional people after the game got successful. Let's take a look at the first five seconds. Muted. That's actually smart. Instead of showing acolytes, he shows the reviews. Because this is something that people actually care about. They don't care about some website awards that you maybe you have bought them, you know, like, uh, maybe some shady shit went on, but that's something tangible. That's the first five seconds. Okay. He shows the game, zooms out, and then switches over to look at the reviews. Yeah. 190,000 positive reviews. That's really smart. So, guys, guys. <laughs> We're gonna do the same on my game and we're gonna have like 10 positive reviews and I'm gonna be like zoom, boom 10 positive reviews <laughs> God damn it. I can't do that to tell a story and how they're going to mesh with the visual. <laughs> 0.001k positive reviews, yeah. And counting up. Exactly. Be creative. As a game developer, you must be a creative person. So use some of that creativity to craft a unique trailer that has hooks of its own. Oh, yeah. And last, hire a professional to help you. Since trailers are such a vital part of the sales pitch for your game, I think it makes the sense to hire someone who really can make your trailer shine. We always work with Marlon, and I cannot recommend him highly enough, if you can get him. Uh, so let's briefly take a look at a few trailers. I'll start okay. with the trailer we created for Crypto the Necrodancer's early access launch, so you can see how we tried to incorporate all the concepts we just discussed. Okay, well... Driven mad by music. Their twisted souls bound to the beat. And at the bottom, God only knows. You think you're ready? Well, you're not. Certainly does look interesting in the trailer, 100%. 
I'm not going to wait here like a coward any longer. Dad's lost out there, Eli, and he needs help. You can't stop me. I'm going to the crypt of the Necro Dancer. You want trailers to make you feel something, and you're more likely to remember a trailer when it activates numerous senses, memories, and parts of your brain. So audio is very important. People have told us that portions of the music and voiceover from our trailers have given them chills, which is about the best result that we could hope for. Uh, this next trailer is from the Kickstarter campaign for Hyperlight Drifter, and this trailer almost single-handedly earned their Kickstarter $650,000. Okay. Please don't make it so loud. How? It's a still image. Okay. I see screen tearing. It's a relaxing game, I guess. Aesthetics? I see. It's the aesthetics. Like, okay, I mean, the aesthetics are really good, but I'm always, I'm just, I guess I'm just a hardcore gamer that always looks for gameplay, okay? This trailer, it makes you feel things. Uh, it shows this world full of dead creatures, ancient devices, monsters and tubes, mysterious symbols and giant bosses, and it teases you with mysterious and beautiful world. I also like how the music slowly builds in volume and intensity, and then it ends with a melancholy campfire, which really sets the drifter feel. Uh, we have one last trailer here. This trailer is from the original Gears of War game, and in my mm -hmm. opinion, it's the best video game trailer ever made. Okay. Uh, I still remember it nearly 10 years after it launched, and I got this video from YouTube where a fan had posted it. The fan's bootleg copy of the trailer has 12 million views, so other people obviously remember it too. Okay. The creative juxtaposition of the sad, slow song during a frightening and violent video is amazing, and it achieves all of this in 60 seconds. Oh, wow. Worn out places, worn out faces Hide my head, I wanna drown my sorrow No tomorrow, no tomorrow And I find it kinda funny, I find it kinda sad The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had I find it hard to tell you, I find it hard to take when people run in circles, it's a very, very mad, mad There are so many other amazing trailers out there too. If you search the web for best trailers of all time, you're sure to learn a lot. For example... But why is it so good? Evoked emotion and looked impressive. Sadness, feelings. Mm-hmm. Cakes is numb. No, 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 no. I, I, I can. I know what to, in feelings it feelings it invoked in me. It basically gave me this post-apocalyptic war war ridden zone feel that you're being alone, everything's lost, loneliness. Sure, I felt that too. I told the whole story in a minute. Okay, anyways. So yeah. World expansion. The Taken King had a website that created custom trailers tailored for each individual player based on what they'd achieved while playing the base game. That is some seriously awesome creativity right there. So to conclude this first part of the talk about my strategy for creating consistently profitable indie games, I'd like to refute the often repeated claim that ideas are a dime a dozen. Sure, most ideas are a dime a dozen, but good ideas are extremely valuable. If mm -hmm. you can come up with an idea that has great hooks, a viable target market, is something that will promote itself, is something that you're excited to make, and is something that you have the skills and resources to make, then you have something extremely valuable on your hands. Mm -hmm. You have the seed for a game that is very likely to be profitable and may possibly be a hit. Don't let anyone tell you that it's worthless. Instead, guard it jealously. True. The hardest part of being a successful developer, in my opinion, is not making the game. Being a talented game developer is a prerequisite for success, sure, but it's far from sufficient. The hardest part is coming up with a design that actually satisfies all of these conditions. 99% mm -hmm. of ideas will fall short. In the indie space, the technological barriers have melted away, 
We're no longer competing technologically. We're pe yeah. competing creatively, which In is awesome. Intelligently, yeah. Intellectually. Now, you need to be honest with yourself when evaluating your hooks and compare your design to the designs of other games. Is your core concept as compelling as the concepts of Papers, Please or Darkest Dungeon? Are your art and music and feel as amazing as that of Hyperlight Drifter? Mm, Games that like makes these sense. serve as great measuring sticks and will help you to put your own designs into perspective. You don't need to equal or surpass these games, of course, but if your design is nowhere close, it's probably wise to return to the drawing board. So yes, I actually That's tried That's what to I did, by the way. I started with Stardew Valley-like art. I figured out that this wasn't the way forward. The reception of my game was atrociously bad. I had trailers, I had thumbnails for my game, and no one clicked on them. No one watched it, no one gave a shit. Now that I have changed my thumbnail and my game's art, huge improvement. It's like night and day. the revenue potential of a game idea before I create that game? To some, this may seem crass, or it might appear that it could result in soulless games. And I understand that concern. But just because I use this method does not mean that I'll be creating games that I'm loath to make. I just need to come up with so many designs that I stumble across one that ignites my passion while still having solid revenue potential. I'm aware that there are many folks out there who make exactly what they want with no concern for revenue, and I respect that. But with a wife and two kids, I'm somewhat more risk averse. So I come up with many ideas, and I evaluate them until I find just the right one. I would advise that you don't start working on a game until you're reasonably confident that it is a design that meets the criteria listed. Uh, making a game will cost you a lot of energy, time, and money, and money. If you choose the wrong idea, much of that will be wasted. Waiting another month while you seek new inspiration and new ideas is far less costly, in my opinion. Okay, so we've covered the main strategy of designing a game that has hooks, that has a viable target market, and that Hi. can be easily promoted. But there are a number of other factors that can impact your decision making, so we'll discuss okay. a few of those considerations now. All right. I think early access on Steam is a great thing, and that a lot of the fear that surrounds it is unjustified. You may have seen this chart online or others like it, but I don't think it necessarily reflects reality. First, you need to treat your early access launch as though it's practically your final launch. You don't want a delayed post-launch spike like the one you see on this chart. You need to use all of your promotional creativity to ensure that your launch is a noteworthy event. If you don't, you will run the risk of getting stuck in a self-perpetuating loop. You'll have slow sales at the start, which can lead to continued slow sales as players and press who look at the game may think, oh, this is a game that doesn't have many reviews. When you have, let's say, 10,000 wish lists and you release your game, all of those 10,000 people will get an email from you that your game is out. When you do early access release, that won't happen because it's not a real release. And that's why people make early access discounts because then when you hit, I think it was 20%, you will send out an email to everyone who has wishlisted your game because the game is on discount. When you do early access, when you do a release, you don't have to do a discount because Steam will still send an email to all of your wishlists. Second, this chart shows sales declining over time. I think that if you have the right plan for early access, you can actually grow your sales over time. Take a look at Nuclear Thrones graph on SteamCharts.com sometime, or even Subnautica. You'll see that thanks to their frequent updates, Vlambeer managed to grow their player base over time. We were actually starting to see this with Necrodancer 2, with the last- You see that on uh, Stardew Valley 2. You can grow your player base over time, and thanks to the Steam video is, they take a look at your players, they take a look at how long they play, how many buy your game, they keep Two promoting you. our final launch. Yes. If you have a game that can keep people interested long term and you have a development method that keeps them coming back to see what's new, yes. you can certainly use early access to great advantage. Okay. And last, cool. this chart also shows that the final launch is a non-event, hardly even a blip in sales. This certainly can be the case, but it can be the case for a non-early access launch too. Mm -hmm. You just need to ensure that there's something noteworthy about your final launch that gets people talking. It's going to be more difficult than your initial launch, sure, since people have already been playing and talking about the game. But with Necrodancer, we were able to turn our final launch into a spike at least as large as those we see from Steam sales. So what are the benefits of early access? Well, I think there are many. I like the fact that you get to find out what your community wants the game to be. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should listen to every feature request that uh, is sent your way, but I do think that you should be mindful of what the community at large is doing with the game. Yeah. I didn't realize that speedrunning was going to become such a focus for Necrodancer, uh, and thanks to early access, that I was makes able sense. to see that and adapt it's the game, a -like game. speedrunning even more fun for the community. Early access also lets you avoid being fully judged by critics and Metacritic until your game is 100% perfect. You're going to produce a better game thanks to all the feedback and bug yep. spotting from the community, 100%. and this will pay off. But there are drawbacks to early access too. Only certain genres will work. The benefit of early access only accrues if you have a community, so a game that players play once and then abandon isn't going to work. Early access also makes it difficult to make major changes to the core gameplay. For an example of this, you should take a look online at the troubles the Darkest Dungeon team had when they introduced their corpse mechanic. 
And last, it may seem counterintuitive, but you need... Huh, that's interesting. So me taking my time with early access or releasing my game is actually a good decision. Not updating my game and just waiting until I have a version where I'm like 99% sure I'm not going to change the core mechanics. It's actually the right decision here. Because that's what I'm ultimately doing here. To ensure mm -hmm. that your game is very polished and playable even before you early access it. Yeah. People don't want to play a broken game regardless no. of whether or not it's in early access. You'll that's generate true. a lot of negative, re negative reviews and that may be hard to recover from. Oh, yeah. Instead, you should launch a slice of your game that is polished and playable and leave the final content or additional features for development during early access. Many people are hesitant to buy early access games, so having a high review score on Steam will go a long way towards allaying those fears. Necrodancer had a 99% positive rating during early access, Holy. and I think that was a key factor in our success. Damn. Now, I have a final few tips that didn't fit into any other section, so I'll talk about them here. Okay. First, I think it's important to come up with great hooks that get people interested in your game, but you need to be just as aware of the factors that may turn people off. Take art style, for example. Mm. Remember that game, Airscape the Fall of Gravity, that I mentioned earlier? Its gameplay was inspired by Super Meat Boy, but for some reason they chose to go with a much cuter art style. Oh. I think that this mismatch hurt them, as people yep. looking for a hardcore difficult game that not makes sense. to look cute. So Super Meat Boy is bloody. Naming is another example. The precursor to the game Rocket Unless League, you turn it cute, but keep the bloodiness. Now that would be appealing. You have some cute whatever things going around and they get ripped into pieces and destroyed and like taken off hands and arms and legs. That would have been cool, right? Was a game similar in design, but it was named Supersonic Acrobatic Rocket Powered Battle Cars. Impossible to remember and it doesn't even have a good acronym. In contrast, the game Don't Starve has an awesome name. It's short, easy to remember, and tells you a bit about the gameplay to get you interested right off the bat. Last, you should be thinking long term. I've been making indie games professionally since 2004, but I've been making games as a hobby since I was six. It takes a long time to hone your game making skills, and it also takes a long time to build up your reputation and awareness within the industry. Mm -hmm. I talked about the importance of your team and about ensuring that your game stands out on, on many axes. And unless you can make hooky graphics, music, audio, and gameplay all by yourself, you will need to attract talented teammates to work with you. The more games you make and the more you put yourself out there at conventions and festivals, the more your reputation will snowball, and the more likely it will be that people will want to work with you. But it takes time. Uh, but yep. don't just network True. for the sake of networking. I've made tons of friends in the industry just because I like making friends and helping people. It turns out that some of those friends ended up becoming collaborators years later, and many have given me gameplay feedback that have made my games far better. But those are just bonuses, not the goal. We're fortunate to work in an industry that is so supportive, so get out there and be a positive part of it. So the C++, yeah. So, in conclusion, we've now discussed my strategy for using hooks, market analysis, and promotion for creating a successful indie game. It's tough out there these days, but it's still very possible to succeed as an independent game developer. I see one or two games launch on Steam each week that make millions, and yet are made by small teams. I hope that you'll come away with this talk from, with a few more tools in your tool bag to help you find that kind of success. I know that this isn't the only way to make successful indie games. There are many people out there doing well using entirely different methods. But I do think that this method is helpful because it has explicit steps you can follow, and if you practice it, and if you come up with the right ideas, you can be much more confident that your games will succeed. Okay, that's the end of my talk, but if you'd like to know more, I occasionally post similar content on my Gamma Sutra blog and on YouTube, Very nice. so drop me a follow on Twitter and I'll keep you posted. Thanks. This guy's Ryan Clark, sir. Very good stuff. Very informative. Very long, unfortunately, but very informative. And it looks like there's not really much that you can do to support him other than, well, go and buy his games if you like him. Maybe Crypt of the Necrodancer.